the all right yeah. all right wait three two one go hello 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 this is Corey thompson from dice tower now and this is the pod father of gaming steven bonacore you are listening to board games insider episode 267 wow and we are recording it on march 1st 2023 board games insider is a proud member of the dice tower network and in just one week, Corey, you and I will be in Vegas, baby, Vegas, for <laughs> Dice Tower West. Wow, I can't wait. I love Vegas, I love Dice Tower conventions, and I love torturing Tom Vassell. It's like the <laughs> trifecta of awesomeness. Corey, I hope you will join me in all the festivities in Las Vegas, including torturing Tom. I am so excited to head to West. This is one of my favorite conventions. It's such a game playing convention and it really so is. many people are there. So I there's so many people that have been texting me and I want to get together with who I haven't seen in such a long time. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. Can't wait. I can't. But you still have not committed to torturing Tom with me. So um, uh, that's disappointing. But maybe I can convince you between now and then. Uh, I'm under contract. So. <laughs> well, what's going on in Corey Thompson's life? Honestly, right now, I've got a little mini convention going on at my house. So I have woken up super early because there's a whole bunch of uh, owners and designers and game people in the other room sleeping, hopefully. Uh, literally, I went to bed at 2 a.m. But Pacific time. Jack Andrews is here, who's designer of Sagrada and, you know everything uh we've got aldo here who's one of the owners of kubla con uh we've got mike eckert who's one of the other owners of kubla con tons of people over uh really the best part is that we did not invite steven <laughs> so. <laughs> it really was a shame that i um i couldn't make it but with you know i'll be telling you what's going on this week in my life in a second but and also of course I'll be out on the West Coast again in less than a week for Dice Tower West. So True. I I, I am totes jelly on the entire thing. I saw you guys in your wine cellar picking out <laughs> bottles of Opus One to drink, which I could have been guzzling down. I could have, I would have been sleeping in that wine cellar, just popping up corks and go ahead. It was fantastic. We That's had a great. nice little group here. And we actually had a and if Asma is telling me about this really cool game from this Buana Core guy that they're reviewing, let me tell you all about <laughs> this amazing. <laughs> stop, stop right there. Uh, <laughs> yes. So one of the people there is from Office Dog, and uh, she hinted to you about things. It was that's a pretty funny story that that you told me kind of offline that you told her. Oh yes, you know about it because you have play tested the game, but. Oh, yes. very, very cool, my friend. Very cool. I'm you having a great time. Having a fantastic time. Uh, we're playing games, staying up all hours, eating great food. Uh, it's all the things that you think that a little game convention should be. So we're going to be doing this today, tomorrow, and the next day. And, yeah. Uh, just basically showing Daryl Napa Valley and having a great game time. <laughs> That's awesome. I really got to get myself back out there again. We had such a good time when uh, Paula and I were there. So let's really try to put that on the schedule again for some time when it's a little bit quieter. In the meantime, what's going over at what's going on over at the Pod Father of Gaming? Well, gaming of the week. I played a game this week that's only been sitting on my shelf for six months or so. <laughs> since since Gen Con, I think that's oh, I have got games. I've got games from 20 years that I haven't I haven't played, but that's another story, of course. But um I picked up at Gen Con at the Cosmos booth The Adventures of Robin Hood. Have you oh, played this game? It's really cool. It's from the designer of Andor of the whole series of My, Andor games. Michael it's Menzel, it. noted artist. And True. game designer. He's a gorgeous art. And Menzel's art is impeccable. And that's really where he kind of started in the industry. But now he also does game design. Um, amazing, yeah. 
amazing game, though. Andor has won just tons of awards. So Robin Hood was super exciting when it came out ages ago when all the cool people were playing it. <laughs> and well, now yeah. you, you're, you've started playing it just in time for the expansion to be released. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, if they, if it is. I'm not sure. Is, yeah, is the there Friar one coming? Tuck expansion just came oh. out. Oh, it did? Yeah. I, I, I'm writing it writing it down. I'm the Friar, Friar <laughs> Tuck. I have to immediately go buy that. But let me let me summarize yeah. this game. First of all, it's a family weight game. So it is not a heavy game. It, it is a light weight game cooperative where it's sort of choose your own adventure, but not. It's sort of storytelling, but it's not. It's it has it uses all of these kind of interesting um elements of of, of a game which telling you a story. Um, but you're moving around the board with, without knowing necessarily where to go to do things. Um, and the mechanics are so cool. The way you move has to do with these little, like call them rulers, but they're not rulers. They're little pieces of wood that you place down to, to make your move across the board. They're the little characters. Their bases are the little rulers. I love it. It's amazing. And, but the neatest, and then you have a book that takes you through the story, the adventure. So like when you do, when you, when you go to your next story, you read the prologue and then it tells you what your objective is. And then you just try to figure out how to do it. And the coolest, coolest part of all is that the board is double layered in that like each one of the characters that appear on the board and each one of the locations, you kind of pull it up. You literally pull it up and turn it over when you have used that location, it's absolutely an amazing way of going and doing things. I mean, I just, I'm so in love with it. 10 out of 10. It didn't win Spiel des Jahres, but it was nominated. Yeah. It, Cascadia won, which was my number one game of that year. And I didn't know this game, so I didn't play it. I would have put this, you know, as number two, probably. So it was like right up there. Um, beautiful, beautiful game. Very excited to be playing this uh, right now with Paula. Oh, it's such a cool one. I love that lift up the board mechanic. It reminds me, um, uh, the Brants, uh, Marcus and Inca Brant had their uh, legacy game, uh, Rise of Queensdale, had a board with hex pieces that lifted up. And that one, this is true, it actually came with a little miniature plunger that looked exactly like a toilet plunger that oh, you would use to grab on to the pieces and oh. lift them up off the board. Oh, that's fun. You use your fingernails on this. So uh, if you don't got good nails, you can't get them up, but it's I a great game. My little plunger. <laughs> <laughs> Please check out, if you get a chance to check out the adventures of Robin hood. Um, so uh, as I mentioned um, before dice, I'm going to be in dice Tower west with Corey next week. Uh, and um by the way, just us, not, nobody else. It's just, just us. This is going to be the two of us hanging out in Vegas yep. alone. That's Dice Tower West is smaller than you think. It's two, two three people. Two, two three, 2,500 or so people. <laughs> um, but before that, I got some great friends from Canada coming. Uh, Jeff and Debbie, uh, they're oh. es escaping the frozen, frigid north. Uh, and they're spending the weekend here. So that's the reason why I can't be out with you. Uh, we're going to be gaming. We're going to be eating. I have my own drinking. Canadian refugee here. That's right. You have Daryl Andrews. <laughs> he escaped. He went west. Jeff and Debbie are escaping and they're coming uh, south. Um, and uh, we're going to be going into this wonderful place that's nearby that is a um, a place for fine spirits. And they have the entire place. I, I think I might have mentioned this. The entire place, the, the place is lined with bottles that are backlit. Lit. You can get single malt scotches. You can get bourbons. Beautiful place. Expensive place. Well, but, you know, anytime you're drinking these fine whiskeys, you're going to have a, a great time. It's going to cost you a little bit of money. So that's my weekend plans with Jeff and Debbie, and then over to Dice Tower West. And as I mentioned, we will be playing um, my prototype. Uh, so if people want to do a play test there, but this is going to drop right in the middle. Well, actually right in the beginning, this will drop next Wednesday. Uh, the convention will have just started when it does drop. So um, if you do hear it, come say hello, of course. Uh, and uh, Corey, why don't we commit next week, serious, this is serious, to doing a, a recording there we can even do it like 
kind of like in the Greek gaming area so that we get some little like nice buzz and, and stuff. And if people come over, we can even talk to them and things like that. I think that's a great idea. I'll try to fit you into my schedule. You've tried a very fit. busy, very important person. A yeah. lot going on. What yeah. a what a guy you uh, are. All right. Yeah. In the meantime, yeah. because he's obnoxious, we'll get over to the event deck. All right. So the first <laughs> thing we have here is Stonemeyer Games sharing tabletop games in print versus digital sale totals. Um, it, and and to preface this. Uh, Jamie Stegmeyer, the CEO over at Stonemeyer, he is always extremely forthcoming with finances, with numbers, very unlike most other private companies. And we can debate all day yeah. if this is a good idea or not a good idea. But Jamie I wants to talk how about open it. and how transparent it is. The only other company I know that's done this in the past has been Steve Jackson. Games. Yep, that's exactly right. They release an annual report. So let me read a little bit of this and we'll talk. Stomar Games shared some totals for the number of tabletop games in print versus digital sell totals for their board game lines in a recent article. Um, the data showed the total units sold to date for Stonemeyer's primary full AI digital games compared to the total units in print for the tabletop versions of those games. The data does not factor in board game arena data at all. And the data sets broke down as follows. Let me go with wingspan first. Total digital, 674,000 units sold on digital platforms. And on the tabletop, the physical games, it's one point seven million copies which is a tremendous amount wow. making it one of the biggest games ever in in our industry uh second biggest here would be scythe scythe interestingly has sold digitally about the same as it has sold on tabletop about 530 to 545 thousand units on both charterstone 37,000 digital, tabletop 97,000. Viticulture, this is interesting, not popular necessarily digitally, 23,000. Uh, the tabletop game, 234,000. So what does this tell us? First of all, one of the um, the principles of the, the digital versus physical is that digital sales fuel physical, physical sales fuel digital. That has been essentially proven way long ago by a big study that was done by Days of Wonder before they were even part of the Asmodee group. And mm -hmm. that's something that's always been the case. In this one, it's interesting to hear how it changes game to game. Any comments, Corey, on either the games or these, these figures, which I think are phenomenal? I just find it amazing. Um how many digital sales there are. There's always this argument going on that if a company releases a digital sale, it might detract <clears throat> from their physical. Um, people are always worried about competing with themselves. But this just proves, like you said, that the two really keep each other going. I think Viticulture might be an outlier in this. Viticulture was a very early digital release. And there were, some people were complaining about the actual digital version of viticulture so it might be artifactually a little bit on the low side but all those others are just crazy close numbers uh you know with wingspan having essentially half digital that they have physical that's amazing and i know people have talked about the digital version of wingspan being just spectacular it's gorgeous it's so well done indeed indeed so uh congratulations to uh Stonemeyer games for these great numbers and again wingspan is a genius game beautiful game fantastic game <clears throat> i'm i'm sure it's going to be staying around for a long time the next one is a i'm going to call this a sad thing but not because of the end result but because of how it's happened so brass birmingham has become the number one game on board game geek followed by Pandemic Legacy Season 1 and Gloomhaven, which has shared the top spot, which is shared, has been in the top spot for five years approximately, is now at number three. Now, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But the problem is that as of Tuesday night when we put this, so this is probably at least a week ago, um, there were 187 votes of one, giving a rank of one, to Gloomhaven 
just in the past one week. So people oh, yeah. are people are stuffing the ballot box, and people are, I'm going to say the word with a, with a bleep. People are a holes. Just be a be an adult. If a game is more valued by somebody else, let it rise to the top. It's beautiful. Brass Birmingham, beautiful game. Bloomhaven, great game. Any one of these deserves to be number one. But don't be a jerk and rate something a one or Agreed. a ten or a ten. I mean, you know, don't you know if you thought if you thought Brass Birmingham was a a nine and a half, that's that's your rating. Maybe you thought it was only a nine. Leave it. Don't make it a 10 just because you want to screw over someone else. Don't give something a one. That's childish, and you're a child for doing it. Anybody who's listening to me who's done it, you're a child. Absolutely. I, I think you put it best with stuffing the ballot box. It was crazy. I did, you know, I looked also, I looked into BGG. You can very easily see what it's what games have been rated recently, and they were all ones on Gloomhaven. You just you saw nothing else for a long time. So, and this started as soon as the news came out that New, Gloomhaven had gone down to number two and Brass Birmingham had gone up to number one. Right. It's on the good side of all of this, there's only since BGG started, there's only been seven games that have made the number one spot. Uh, so this is not a common event when um, the number one, even the number two spot starts changing around. So um, congratulations again, like you said, to Brass Birmingham. It's really cool that we've got a new contender up there, but we're just waiting for all of the hype around the news story to quiet down and people to stop trying to influence this so directly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just not something you should be doing. Let, let it fall, man. I personally will play Gloomhaven over brass Birmingham, but that's just my style. I mean, yeah. I'd rather be in that adventure style than in that, like my brain is going to explode. I, and they're I just love, not comparable. They're right. such different games. And I love Martin Wallace games and I love, yeah. I love it, love it, love it. But I don't care that my of those two, and I oh, and I love Pandemic Legacy. My gosh, that game was evolutionary yeah. in such a material way. All of these games are brilliant. All of them are different. Just rate the game and let it Can happen. You name the previous games that had made number one slot. I apologize, I misspoke. There's been six, only All six together. other games. So it's it's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, they were, I'll just tell you, it's been Pandemic Legacy, Twilight Struggle, Agricola, Puerto Rico, Tigris and Euphrates. Yeah. And the first one was Paths of Glory. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine that? And I remember, I actually owned a that. A long time ago. Yeah. I owned that for a while, basically only because it was like a top 10 game. I bought it, but it's one of those games that like is impossible to get to the table and it's a uh, yeah, it's a it's an encyclopedia type rule set. So um, I never played. I hear it's an amazing, amazing uh, war game. So we reported in. In fact, Corey, it's funny. I already got uh, someone coming to um, me this morning because because we, we drop the episode, you know, um, on Wednesdays. So the yeah. last episode, um, uh, Marion, my good friend, Marion, who, you know, mm. very well. Uh, she said, wow, that was an ominous, uh, title to, uh, to the episode, which I can't remember even what I called it, but it was like, you know, the decline of, 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 of games, you know, or something like that. I'm trying to like bring up my title here so that I can actually, uh, see it. It's coming up very slowly. Oh my goodness. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, the one about the decline in the North American board game market is what I just called the episode when we posted it. Um, and in the article we now have here, it's showing that the German board game market is also down 5%. Now, uh, did you post this particular article? What was this? No, Ignacy? I think Ignacy put that up. Yeah. So it's basically, it's, it's basically showing that the, what we've, what we've talked about and that was reported by Embracer for Asmodee that the North American market seemed to have sh seems to have shrunk by at least 8% last year, where Asmodee sales were down 5%. And this article, which is on Brandora, I've never heard of this one, uh, was down approximately 5% last year. So we're talking about a 
definitely a global phenomenon. And and I'll use phenomenon because it is by far the first time we have seen in the, you know, in all the time I've been in the industry, a significant decline, not a, not a, you know, not something that's going to truly wreck the industry, but it's definitely a major decline in sales. So those who were thinking that we were going to hit a bubble of some type, this could be part of that kind of logic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Matthew Dunstan, he's a great designer out there in the UK. Um, uh, he's pitched me games several times. Really lovely guy. He reported on Twitter, he put out, um, again, another one of those very open articles regarding how much money he has made as a designer over the last um, couple of years. Uh, and he reported, and I want everybody to relax when I say this, <laughs> because I don't want ev everybody out there to say, well, I, I'm going to be a designer now because look at all this money you can make. Excuse me. He is he's a very um he's prolific and he is very known and he's very good and he's had some hits. So yeah. um in 2022, he said that he has made 113,970. So 114,000 euro. Let's call that 125,000 US dollars. Um and but the, the year before that was only 44,000 euro. So let's call it $50,000. So he is doing very well, but his income from last year was broken down into most of that 114,000 euro was in royalties from 20 released tabletop games and game series. So he has got 20 games out there. So he got royalties yeah. on a lot of games in the past. And then the rest of it were like small, small amounts from advances and uh, royalties from a digital game and payments that he got demoing games for somebody, I guess, at a convention. He also broke so, it down. I'm sorry, Corey, let me finish this one. He also broke yeah. it down by game, and it's it's wildly different, game versus game. So, like, it, three of his games would account for, let's say, 80% of his entire sales, and that would be in order Echoes, uh, Adventure Games, uh, and monumental, and where all of his other one, two, three, four, five, six that he, you know, those six others, but then all 20 or all 17 of the rest of those would be the 20%. So it's, yeah, it's wildly different depending on the game. Um, and this year was a particularly good year, he says. It's not never like this. Well, you can see that too, because last year was at 44,000, this year at 115. The other thing I was going to say is, you know, I've talked with a lot of designers about things like this. And what always strikes me is how amazingly vastly different it is designer to designer, also game to game. There's no standardized contract. There's no standardized royalties. There's no standardized income. It's all over the place. So yeah, this, this looks really good this year for Matthew and this, he's a fantastic designer, but there are so many really good designers who will make a lot of money off one of their games or absolutely no money off of a very popular game. It's such wild west out there. Of it, yeah. I mean, it really is. Happens. It really is. There, there are some quasi standards that game designers can, can try to achieve in, in their contracts. And they should of course always ask, others you know there are plenty of people that will tell you i mean some people think that they should get much more than they can get especially new designers only the top tier designers are going to get any kind of the even the bigger percentages on a, on a brand new game um but they started they started at the bottom too so you have to keep your expectations in check um but definitely talk to your peers right that's that's important and to see what a contract should look like and that's that's kind of important so um, the French Game Awards, the French As Dior, uh, yep. gold. I put this one in. Did you? I okay. Well, you because you talk <laughs> about this one. This is and this is th for this year, and this this is given out at cons, um, yep. and it's got a bunch of interesting games, and some of them I don't know that well. So tell me about it. Sure. 
as Dior, it's been going on for a long old time. This is the French equivalent of the Spiel des Jahres. It's certainly not at that level. Spiel des Jahres is still, I would say, known as the most coveted of the awards in the board game industry. Absolutely. But as Dior is up there, most publishers know it, most people know it. Uh, so they gave out their awards, and there were four categories. Uh, the children's game of the year is uh, Flashback Zombie Kids, uh, which the Zombie Kids line is done fantastic. Uh, so it's it's such a nice game. Um, then the next one, the expert, I'm saving the big one for the end. The expert game of the year was our old favorite Arc Nova. Uh, so no big surprises there. Arc Nova has been blowing everybody away. People are always talking about it. Now that people actually can get copies of it, the, for a while it was a little hard to keep up with demand. Um, it's People are talking about it all over. Yeah. The immediate game of the award is Challengers. Uh, locally, it's published by Z-Man. It's One More Time Games. Uh Challengers, it had a long development process, and I was friends with some of the people who were developing it, and I saw it grow as it was coming along, so I'm really happy for uh, One More Time Games about this one. Uh, so Challengers is the, they call it the initiate, but it's really the entry-level game is, I guess, a better way to call it, um, as Dior. And then the big one, the as Dior general public game of the year is Acropolis from uh, Hachette. Uh, Acropolis is a tile laying game. Uh, I haven't gotten a chance to play it yet, but mm -hmm. every person who's played it, it just raves about how fantastic it is. It's on my list for, oh, let's say a big convention in Las Vegas that I might be attending in the next week or so. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'd love to play it with you if you um, uh, if you have a seat open. That would be interesting. I um, haven't, haven't played it. I've seen people playing it. Uh, since it's gotten this big notoriety, I would like to definitely check it out with you if you have a, have a chance. Oh, yeah, of course. The next thing is interesting, and I think you must have put this in because Ignacy did I not put this put in. I put this one in, and I thought it was really cool. So uh, recently on PBS, there was a documentary about Monopoly, about the history of Monopoly. And I knew a lot about it that uh, other people also knew. By the way, this is one episode in a series on PBS called The American Experience. Interesting. So this is season 35, episode three of The American Experience. You can find it online and watch it online. Um, so Monopoly was uh, originally designed uh, by uh, a woman, and she had passed it around to her friends and she had gotten a patent on it and had tried to publish it. But then it was effectively stolen by its credited designer, uh, Clarence Darrow. But it's an interesting period in the history of board games in America. Board games used to be a communal property. Every family had their own handmade board games that they drew out and they would pass down generation to generation. And you'd never really bought board games. The concept of publishing a board game and buying it is very new in the early uh, 20th century. And Monopoly was one of the first ones. And it's just got this devious, crazy history of where it came about. So I really recommend this documentary about you know, just the history of board games in general, and specifically all the nasty stuff that happened behind the scenes with Monopoly. That is interesting. I, I, I've heard a little bit of of that, the, the way the game might have been stolen or something like that. Uh, I'm definitely, I got this, my third note I've now made <laughs> from this podcast, <laughs> PBS American Experience, a Monopoly documentary. I will def definitely be checking that out. So here we have some sad news. It'll be our last piece. We're going to end on a sad note. Um, John Sepnick passed away. He was the founder of Cryptozoic, and he passed away on Valentine's Day. Um, uh, very sad. Corey, I, did you know him? I did yeah. not know John. I didn't know him, but 
I knew him secondarily. I have a lot of friends, uh, including people who are here today and people who texted me who knew him well and and thought he was a great guy and always loved hanging out with him. Uh, he worked for a while at Upper Deck as well, I believe. Um, right. But um, he was, you know, one of the big people in board games and uh, he was an active kind of crazy guy. So uh, from what I hear, there was an accident kite surfing. Wow. Um, okay. So he wasn't wasn't an old guy. But uh, very sad to hear. Yeah, about I don't. That. He I was don't kite surf. He was a big guy in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly don't kite surf, so he's uh, obviously younger than me. Um, yeah, it's very sad. Cryptozoic's a company that um, they don't normally. You know, we don't. Other people in the industry don't socialize with them, not for any reason other than they just kind of stay to themselves. So I've never had a contact inside of Cryptozoic. So I had never had the pleasure of, of knowing and meeting John. So um, condolences to him and his family and and fans of, of Cryptozoic. So sad to see uh, any of us um, yeah. you know, in the industry pass along. So now let's get over to strategy and tactics. So here we, of course, answer our questions from our guild, and we have one from a very good friend of the show. We have a couple I see. He's been posting in here. Kurt Van <laughs> Hoyveld, who's Vitruvian Gamer on Board Game Geek, he says, how many games get pitched to you at a convention like Spiel? How many of those are considered and looked at in more detail? What makes Portal Games interested in a pitched game? So I'm not going to answer that last part of it, but I will answer the first part. And the answer is at a convention like Spiel, when I was taking meetings, I literally had a meeting every half hour, every day of the convention. So you can figure out how many games are being pitched based on that. The convention goes from 10 to seven. I would always block the first hour uh, to so that the booth was just running correctly and the last hour for any last minute things that had to happen. But after that, every half hour would be booked with a meeting because we had dedicated meeting space in the back. And I know Ignacy has exactly the same thing, though he usually has his people taking meetings for him and I were taking <laughs> all the meetings for Stronghold. And then it was Travis and I, but I was still doing most of the meetings um, during the latter half. And you know what are what are looked at in more detail, and well, as you're getting the games, and sometimes they're they're prototypes, and you'll take a prototype if if it just seems like it's going to fill a niche that you've never seen, uh, so you'll take that prototype. But um, most of the games we took were actually not prototypes; they were publications of other games from European publishers that wanted a co-publishing partner. So we would take back uh, sixty games. Six zero games that were either real games or prototypes, mostly actually published games. And we would then try to weed through them, see which ones made any sense whatsoever back in the light of the day when we could clear our heads. And then we would play many of them, 30 of them, crazy number of those games. And we used to do it at a convention called Metatopia in New Jersey. Because that was a mm. game, that was a place where designers and publishers got together, and it was literally happened right after the spiel, and we would just run through all these games, and a lot of times we'd invite the public in to play under like an NDA. Please don't talk about any games. See, we're not sure we're going to do them. We want your input on it as well. So that's a great question from Kurt. So Kurt asked so another question: Vitruvian Gamer. How did COVID influence playtesting of game designs? I know there's a lot of online playtesting. Was it harder to balance games that way? Can you see a difference in the final result of a game? How is the balance between online and physical playtesting now that the worst part of the pandemic is over? Corey, do you know about how this? Yeah, I actually have done a lot of playtesting. I've been talking to a lot of publishers and I think that it was a tremendous change. So... Playtesting online, there's a whole bunch of things that get lost when you playtest games online. There's things about the ergonomics of the board. They talk about zones of play. So when you're physically there, you realize, you know, if I reach over here, I there's a whole bunch of pile of game stuff and I don't see it immediately. But right in front of me is where I keep my main playing things. The board might be too small and too far away. All of that is immediate and accessible in a digital play test. So you lose the importance of physicality, where things are on the board. 
The other one I've talked to a lot of designers about that's kind of funny is what happened to all the dexterity games? During <laughs> COVID, it was yeah. really <clears throat> almost impossible to play test a dexterity game. So I think we got a lull in dexterity games, uh, which is really funny. They're starting to come back now. But that's... the other big one is uh, we got so used to play testing digitally that nowadays I think that's continuing. The pandemic is, it's not gone by any means, but it's loosening up to the point where people are going to conventions and there's prototypes around and people are playtesting. But initial playtesting is still, I would say, primarily digital. There's still a huge influence of doing your playtests on uh, tabletop simulator and formats of this sort, at least to start. And then the physical comes out at meetings, at conventions, um, just yeah. to make sure everything flows. Yeah. So it, everything you said is 100% accurate. And uh, um, I, I think that the use of technology now in game design and especially game testing, play testing, um, has, has, has just surged and soared because of COVID. So it was starting there before, but now since we're, we got so used to using technology of all kinds during yeah. COVID, game designers put their games up on a tabletop simulator, which by the way, is crappy, crappy. It's just <laughs> terrible. However, it's the only oh, game, yeah. it's the only game in quotes ta in town. So to everybody fair, puts it there. It's the one that's open. So yeah. you can make your own prototype on TTS and you don't have to run it through TTS. People have learned how to program their own things. And especially during the pandemic, uh, people have gotten really good at using yeah. TTS. So it's easy, it's open, and right. you don't have to get permission. So, uh, the other formats might be better, but they are very proprietary and you have to get permission and you have to do it through their rules and things like that. Yeah. I would even I would even go so far as saying any game designer who's listening to us right now, and there are plenty of them out there. If you want to pitch your game, if you want to play test your game, if you want to have your game available, you have to get it out there someplace. And Tabletop Simulator is the place to do it because, as Corey was saying, saying it's it's availability, not its ease of use, but its ease of putting something up there so that you can then use it. Corey and I could be playing my prototype right now, right after this. Jeff and I did so two days ago. We played it on TTS again, getting ready for it for Dice Tower West. So yeah, good good question, um, Kurt. Mario Sousa, who's M Spider underscore 89. He's been a contributor here many times. 20 years ago, the closest thing to technology inserted in a board game was the DVDs in games like Atmosphere. Caveat, I've never played a game like that. I've only nope. seen references. What did you think back then about those kinds of games? How did you use technology? How did you see technology could get better into games? So he's asking, like, what did we think about them? And did I did we envision something better happening? Well, I remember the VHS games too, right? Yes. So that was that was sort of the first one. And then well, you know, VHSs have a huge limitation, right? They're analog. And, you know, if you need to get to a certain point, you got to fast forward, you're going to see things. With a with a DVD, you can just say, okay, go to track seven, boom, and you're there. Um, I played a little bit of both of those. Um, I certainly played a little bit of both. I don't know if I played Atmosphere either. Corey, have you played any of them? And do you have any views I on I played all of them in the okay. day. And okay. I think they were seen as a little bit of a novelty when they first came out. To oh, be yeah. fair, I wasn't in the industry when they came out. This was a long time ago. And I'm old, but I'm not that old. Steven's that old. Steven is that old. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other part of this question, when apps started to get implemented into board games, this is what oh, Mario yeah. Sousa is writing. Um, what was your first emotional reaction as publishers and as gamers? Um, I remember when apps first started getting integrated, there was really a hesitancy on the side of gamers. We didn't know what to do about these technology things. But what I really recommend is there is a video out there. Uh, Christian Peterson, founder of uh, Fantasy Flight Games, saw the integration of digital into board games, of app-driven games, much earlier, I'd say, than the general publishing 
arena. And there is a very famous talk that uh, Christian did about, hey, apps are coming. Digital is coming. You need to get on this bandwagon. And it was it's really fun to watch that video now because it addressed the hesitancy and addressed the fear of digital apps coming in and making these hybrid games. And I'd, I'd say Fantasy Flight still does a really good digital hybrid uh, board game. There's there's so many good ones out there. So they probably had a strong hand in making it more of an accepted standard. Yeah, everything you're saying 100% correct. And I remember distinctly when alchemists came out yes. it's sort of like the first one from cge mm -hmm. and you'd look at use your phone to look at the cards and things would happen on the cards um uh i was very hesitant but at the same point i was like the future is here i did say that like in my head i said the this is this is going to be implemented by more and more people who have the ability to do so so I knew it was going to be a cool thing that would happen over time. Christopher Sutbin, let's take one more from him. It's at Chem Soldier. What prompts someone to decide to hold a game from being released to production, especially after the cost and time and money to develop and produce the initial product? If this happens, does a publisher hold the rights for a later release? Do they revert back to the creator? Is this normally spelled out in the contract? So I'm not exactly sure if he means the game has been fully made i don't think so I, I i don't know i mean it's hard to tell if he means okay we have the game and we're not putting it out that shouldn't happen if, if the game is in your warehouse you need to get that game out you might hold it for a few months but that game sitting there is cost it is a huge i think it's more cost. if a design is pitched to a publisher and the publisher is holding the design but they have not produced so what um what goes into the um uh the decision to hold a game back a design back and that's simply because of the pipeline let's let's talk about it from perspective of um a company has a pipeline of games and they want to release x number of games per year and they want to do so such that they don't crowd their own market they can put push one game so they will do that they will hold a game to say okay we're going to start the production of this game in six months for release six months after that, for instance, so that they can time their releases correctly. And in fact, very often hit conventions because conventions give you so much extra marketing boost. And I know generally in a contract for uh, when a designer gives a game to a publisher in the contract, it'll specify a time period at which point usually the rights to that game revert back. And this could happen after a small print run and the publishers decided they don't want it anymore. And it could happen if the publisher holds a design prototype without making the game after a period of time, it, it does revert back to the publisher, uh, revert back to the designer usually. That but is, it is dictated in the contract. It is dictated in the contract. Thank you for those questions. Let's get over now to our play testing segment. So in play testing, we had my question last week, and my question to all of you was, what is your most played big game of all time? And I we made a definition that we said, a big game for this purpose will be a game that takes over three hours for you to complete when played. And I know that some people play, Mono you know, whatever, Monopoly for three hours, which we shouldn't be playing. But <laughs> they'll they'll play plenty of games that probably shouldn't take over three hours when they play them, but they will play them. So maybe, maybe I'll, let's see. I have not read these answers yet. So let's see. Uh, Corey, anything strike you or should I pick a few? Uh, just when I was generally browsing through these, I saw Terraforming Mars come up a couple of times. Uh, I forget which publisher did that one, but it's... <laughs> Uh, that is one of the ones that strikes my mind is it was, it still is very popular in that range of two to three hours. Lots of people are playing lots of times. Um, that's one of the big ones that's coming up. I was expecting more Twilight Imperium talk. That's usually right. our gold standard game for what is a blah, big, heavy, long game. And I didn't see much talk about it uh, in the comments. Well, Mad Halfling says definitely Twilight Imperium. We used to make uh, sure we played it at least once a year. Dominant Species has to be catching up yeah. along with Through the Ages. Now, to your comment about Terrifying Mars, I still think that's crazy. I still think, look, 
everybody plays games the way they want to play it. You love a game, you want to play it, Terraforming Mars for three and a half hours, God bless you. I will not be playing the game with you. I never play, it never takes me more than two hours to play the game. Maybe a little bit longer, it depends, right? But I just don't AP. I pick my cards and I move along. I move on. To me, the, you know, APing or worrying about every little play that destroys the experience for me. Maybe that should be one of our play testing questions at some point. I mean, how, how do you deal with AP or do you have AP and things like that? But I would not have put that certainly in, <laughs> in my list. Um, some people said uh, Gloomhaven uh, is, is yeah. on their list. Now Gloomhaven, any given scenario, I don't think takes that long, but well, I mean, I, I played a couple hundred uh, scenarios of Gloomhaven, physical game. I played yeah. it a lot. And it would always take over two hours, maybe yeah. just a little well, over two hours, maybe right. three. So it's well, in your in that category. Two isn't three. I'm sorry, Corey. <laughs> two is two is 50% less than three. So uh, I don't know. You and your fancy math. Fancy, fancy <laughs> math. Um, yeah, but you're like you said, uh, wow, the, the amount of people saying terraforming mars is that game is very very uh, interesting to me kirk w who's at the corset maker um he's um he's like predaporter and arc nova are the ones that he always says and I, I by the way i've heard arc nova is a significant step up in time i have not yet not not played it yet i really should over terraforming yeah. mars it's always compared to that so that's why are you using it in the same and the same remember sentence? there's a there's a new one in the play field now so i find it really interesting that terraforming mars has become kind of a type of game so arc nova started being talked about as like terraforming mars or even the terraforming mars killer and now there's a brand new game that came out called earth that is being called the arc nova killer or the really i've arc heard nova like i have not heard and, about the killer portion but i've heard about the game being excellent yeah, people are loving it. But more to the point, uh, these games, they can be really long. I played a lot of uh, Arc Nova, and usually it's about a two, a little over two hour game for me. But a lot of people with three and four player games do talk about having four or five hour sessions of it. Um, it can go on a bit. That's just so interesting for me. You know, and I'm going to mention a couple of guys that, to me, again, I think a lot of people here, we're like, well, it's around three. I wanted to hear about big games. Like, so two people that um, mentioned games that absolutely always go over three hours. Sean Flurry, good friend of yours, says Fantasy Fights Battlestar Galactica with modules from uh, all three of the expansions and five plus players. It's going over three hours. And he said that's that's the oh, one yeah. that he's played the most. And it is. And it is. It's an amazing game. And it's always a three hour game when you're playing with any number of player, a lot of players, and you're playing with some of the expansions. And Joseph Leone says that, um, um the 18xx games are are the ones that have um, have really gone big and he's played them a lot so that's the one that he's pointing to thank you all for uh helping us out and giving us such great answers Corey. now i asked you for a question to put here but you didn't have one ready so i stole the next question that ignacy was going to use hope he doesn't mind Just so throw me under the bus i well you got to think on your feet my friend and you're not doing a good job i think i'm just sorry so no i'm kidding you so why don't you read ignacy's question and then we'll talk about it you want me to just put a question out there right no. off the cuff no i want you to read ignacy's question <laughs> and we'll right. talk about it it's a better question anyway so ignacy <laughs> says uh, how have chat GPT and other AI softs, how will they improve our tabletop gaming in the next 12 months? So for people who don't know, chat GPT is all over the news and it's a really popular AI platform that analyzes uh, patterns in human speech and written things. And it, chat GPT will basically finish almost anything. So you can ask ChatGPT to write um, an essay. You can ask it to write a paper. You can ask it to write an instruction manual. You can ask it to write programming code. And it does not a terrible job. It's a little frightening how dead on it can be. So, you know, how it's... can these predictive AI things uh, change tabletop gaming? Yeah, it's, it's extraordinarily um amazing at what it can do i tried to trick chat gpt 
to talk about God because I said I wanted to. I just yeah. I'm not going to get into it. I, I wanted it. I wanted to take it to a to a different place and to say, well, okay, it's not like a factual thing, right? Per se, because we can't prove God. Yes, it exists, doesn't exist, whatever. I tried to get it to talk to me about the fact that God exists, and it was. It gave me the best answer of all time to like that kind of question. Um, basically saying it's this is a this is a this is a faith thing. It, it's you cannot prove, neither can you disprove. And we, instead of trying to prove, maybe we should have good discussion. It was amazing. It was just now, an amazing way of, of remember of these, approaching. These are pattern analysis. It's looking at previous jillion things people have talked about on the internet jillion, jillion. analyzing pat it's an official number yes it's analyzing the patterns there's not a meaning behind here it doesn't have an agenda it doesn't have something it's trying or proving or trying to use rhetoric on it's pattern matching but having said that most of these chat programs do have hardwired into them things not to talk about <laughs> yes Microsoft famously got in trouble ages ago when they put up, uh, actually on social media, they put an AI chat and it almost immediately went very racist. <laughs> and then they pulled it after one day. What's the name of the, and, the, the AI software that's now doing artwork, which is, again, it's also under the same uh, company has one, uh, which is, what's the name of the company? There's quite that, a few of them. What's the name of the company that owns chat GPT again? Oh, you put me on the spot. Uh, I I, I'm gonna, I'll find it in one second. But yeah. but that oh, open AI, it's open AI. Open AI. So, so yeah. um, open yeah. So open AI also has a um. You can go there and you can sign up and they give you an account and then you can play with Chat GPT. But you can also say, give me, um, please please show me some artwork. Um, please show me an a piece some art that has. Um, a robot smoking a cigarette while taking a walk in a park on Mars. And it will create I... a piece of art that yep. does, does oh, oh, in the style of Da Vinci. <laughs> it does it. It's insane how it can just do that. I, think, exactly. I think we need the uh, the art programs, the AI-driven art programs to start making pictures of Stephen Bonacore. You could... Playing board games, sadly, on Mars. Sadly, on Mars. Sadly, all alone on Mars. It's, it's, it's astonishing. So, Corey, I don't. It's, it's this is just a hard thing to answer, right? I mean, like, um, I do think this is going to end up having an impact on tabletop gaming. I think it's going to have a huge impact on, for instance, uh, potentially when you have a question about a rule in a game, right? What an easy thing to yeah. do. If you focused a, an AI to say, how do I, on, on, you know, War of the Ring, my favorite game. There's there's all these <laughs> corner case rules, like when you get to like, um, do you get a bonus to hunting at, you know, when a Nazgul is in your region versus if you, when do you get the bonus when you pass through uh, a shadow stronghold? And it's, Things like that. I think you'll just you'll be able to ask a, an AI, and it'll spit back the rule. It'll find the page. It'll and it'll give you the exact rule you're looking for. So I think in rules, yeah. that's one place we're going to see it. And by the way, for better or for worse, I mentioned the the one that does the artwork. I'm telling you right now, I've heard it already happened. We will see artwork for games. You know, for like cards. You need 300 pieces of art for cards. We're going to see a 100 percent artwork generated by an AI in a future game yeah. within the next, let's say 12 months, it'll be done. The game might not be out for 12 months, but it'll be done because it's free. And I feel bad for artists. And it's the single place. I had this conversation with Jeff Engelstein, actually, when he was here, he goes, yeah. of all the places I thought AI would take over jobs, take over our lives, artwork. That's like the last place that you would have thought it's crazy. maybe. Any, the other any, part, yeah, any other ways that you think that, yeah. that this could be integrated into board games? Well, the other side of it, um, which is a little tangential, is remember AI, one of the biggest places it's been used is in training and learning how to play games. So Google specifically has an AI division that has played 
absolutely grandmaster champion levels of uh, Go. They played video games. And recently there was an AI program that played Diplomacy, a game purely of talking back and forth to people. The AI learned how to talk to people, and it had on online forums a 70%, 80% win rate. It's amazing. Playing games. So I can see if AI becomes very easy to use and very accessible in that aspect, I might design a game, teach an AI to play it, see what it does, and see if the game's broken, see if there's strategies in there that I hadn't thought about that the AI found that I might need to change in my game design. It's 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 amazing. Um so let's just let's throw it out to everybody else. I mean, I think that's it's, it's an incredible question. And I've actually changed the question just a little bit because I've added in, <laughs> I've added in uh, the part about um, the AI software that does the artwork, which by the way is called Dal E, D A L L dash E for those. And I'm going to put links in the question in our, uh, in our, in our group. So people can do, do this, do the research on this themselves. Um, what do you guys think about this right now? I'm going to go put this, over on our guild on Board Game Geek, and we ask you to comment what you think about it. And you can go explore Chat GPT if you haven't. You can go explore Doll E if you haven't, all at the openai.com website. Or you can make embarrassing pictures of Stephen Bonacore with Doll E. I think that that could only be a problem because it doesn't know me. It's going to be, it might be oh, able to find me. It might, it but knows you. <laughs> it, it hopefully if you would. tried to do it to me, it wouldn't work because there's too many Corey Thompsons. I mean, how many Stephen Bonacores get looked up on a Google search? It yeah. would know you. I'm going to do it. I actually asked ChatGPT, who is the podfather of gaming? And it got it wrong. <laughs> it, it's, it mentioned or some did guy. It get it right. Or did it? Maybe I'm not the podfather. It was very fun. Then I told it it was wrong. He said, I, and it said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll get it right next time. <laughs> Anyway, go over there and answer our question and we'll answer it. Answer our question and we'll answer it back to all of you next week. <laughs> In the meantime, the final scoring. Thank you all so much for listening. Help us spread the word about this podcast by downloading it wherever you like to get your podcast or watch us on the Pod Father of Gaming YouTube channel. Do you want to be part of this podcast? Go over to our guild on Board Game Geek. Ask us questions for the strategy and tactics segment. And of course, answer our question back for the play testing segment. Check out the websites. That's portalgamesus.com, podfathergaming.com, dicetowerdish.com, and dicetowernow.com. We're all over social media. So interact with us, please. Facebook, like our pages, slash Board Games Insider, slash Portal Games US, slash Podfather Gaming, and speak directly with us. Twitter and Instagram, it's at Portal Games US and at Podfather Gaming, at Dice Tower Dish, at Dice Tower Now, and the very active YouTube channels, Portal Games Movies, Portal Games Gameplays, and the Podfather of Gaming, Ignacy on Tic Tac, Tic Tac, Tic Tac, is <laughs> Portal Games US. Yeah, laugh Maybe we should get an AI to, uh, to, to do, do this, this podcast for you. A hundred percent. AI Stephen reading. <laughs> A hundred percent better than me. I guarantee it. We really would love to see you in person. So if you're going to be at Dice Tower West, please come up to me or Corey. We'll probably be hanging out together about three hours a day. So come up, chat, tell us about what you like about the podcast, anything you want to talk about. We would love. Let's play a game together or let's do Vegas things like get a drink together. That'd be great. Board Games Insider, professionally edited by Joshua Bowman from Tabletop Submarine Podcast. If you want to edit him, have him edit your podcast. You can reach him at tabletopsubmarine at gmail.com. And the great voice doing our intro, outro, and in-between segments is that of Ray Greenley, who can be contacted to do voiceover work for you at raygreenleyvoiceover.com. Corey, if you don't know, this is our portion of the episode where we save something for the listeners that we don't normally report on, but it's something interesting. So I have something. Oh. I'm putting up a website with Podfather merch, and there will be Podfather underwear. I'm just saying. Which, by the way, is going to be sitting right next to the Corey merch, because the same person is doing it for both of us. <laughs> and that's our good friend, Marion. Thank you, Marion. 
But uh, we'll tell you, we'll tell you where you can get this insane, ridiculous merchandise. Marion did it for Corey stuff because all the ladies tease Corey about how wonderful oh, he is. No. And he blushes every fair. time. He blushes every fair. time. Go ahead. Marion works for Gen Con and had to learn how to do e-commerce for different aspects of Gen Con and used this as an experiment. Set up a Corey merchandise store to learn how to do all of the merch and e-commerce and art and things like that. So it's I'm I'm the uh unfortunate victim of an experiment and because i could not be outdone by your merch i had to have podfather merch so mine's better mine's better i have a fanny pack you have and i won't wear a fanny pack so there anyway thank you all for listening we'll see you next week hopefully live from dice tower west take care everybody see you later everyone